Um, my Lords, I'd like to begin, if I may, by correcting uh, Lord Callanan uh, on a point of a constitutional convention. He, he uh, criticised the Labour Party from uh, resigning from its commitments in the last uh, Labour election manifesto. I have to tell him that uh, we can't have resiled from those commitments. Those commitments disappeared the day we were defeated in the general election. If a party wins an election, it has a contract with the electorate and it must fulfil that contract, and that's how our democracy works. But if a party is defeated, then it has no such obligation, and it's free, not only free, to find uh, other policies if it wishes to do so, uh, but indeed it's uh, and to be encouraged that it should do that. Uh, and uh, not only constitutional principle, but I think common sense uh, leads in that direction, because if the noble Lord thinks about this for a moment, and I hope that he might think about it for a moment, he'll realise that on his approach, uh, we would still be committed in the Labour Party to nationalisation of the means of production and distribution and exchange, and he and his party would still be committed to opposing Catholic emancipation or opposing the abolition of the Corn Laws. But maybe the noble Lord does, in fact, uh, oppose retrospectively those things. Uh, but the only reason why things move on uh, is because when you're defeated in an election, uh, your commitment uh, at that election disappears uh, and you have to think anew. And it's very, that's a vital part of the process of uh, progress and renewal uh, in a democracy. Now, my lords, anybody who's been involved in a negotiation uh, knows, or ought to know, uh, that the greatest enemy you have, really, is complacency, is self-delusion, uh, is a tendency to underestimate the challenges, to underestimate the obstacles you face, to uh, uh, underestimate the strength of the bargaining power uh, of the counterparty with which you're dealing, and to overestimate your own. Now, the, this government, in the immortal words, words of, uh, uh, of um, Mr. Gove, uh, at the time of the referendum, I have always believed, I think, that, uh, to quote him, uh, the day we leave, all the cards will be in our hands. And they proceeded on the basis that that was true. And they have fundamentally and systematically underestimated the bargaining strength of the people that they were dealing with. Uh, they thought that because the European Union uh, sells more to us than we do to them, uh, and the Germans sell more than anybody else, uh, that the Germans would be running the show We'll be more or less uh, instructing the Commission to be gentle with us, uh, to make whatever concessions are necessary, because that was in the interest of their own firms. Uh, and the idea that the uh, European Union uh, would take a permanent stand on behalf of the Irish, who obviously can, can rightly so, are defending the right to not have their country divided in half uh, by a hideous uh, <coughs> permanent border, um, that wouldn't have occurred to them. They would have said, oh no, no way. That, uh, uh, the European Union with 500 million people is going to allow a country with two or three million uh, to stand in its way. They were completely wrong on all those points. Disastrously wrong. And what's more, wrong for the wrong reasons as well. Comes back to the quotation uh, from Lord Cormac, from T.S. Eliot, I mean, by via Lord Cormac. The British, I'm afraid, have underestimated the Irish for 800 years. And I'm sorry that in the Tory party of today, that very bad tradition, and disreputable tradition, should still be continuing. The Tory party have never understood the moral force behind the European Union, the genuine idealism behind the European Union, the genuine commitment to the concept of solidarity in the European Union. They don't understand those things at all. They are what I suppose uh, Castle Ray uh, <coughs> called a, a, a piece of um, mysticism and nonsense. It's not mysticism and nonsense, it's an actual fact that they should be taken into account. So let me tell them that it's going to go on making this mistake. The Continentals are not going to abandon the Irish. Uh, they're not going to abandon the backstop. Uh, and uh, the sooner the government realise that, uh, the better. Now, my lords, this uh, capacity for self-delusion uh, in the government doesn't end there. It's right across the board. It's an extremely worrying facet uh, of the present uh, administration. It stretches into the economy. Now, I don't want to be seen to be unduly criticising uh, the noble Lord, uh, Lord Bates, because 
in common with the rest of the House, I think. I'm very fond of the uh, noble Lord, uh, Lord Bates, and Lord, secondly, the noble Lord, Lord Bates, is not uh, in his place today, which I regret. Uh, but, of course, that's I'm totally understandable. That's not a criticism of him either. Nevertheless, he is a government minister, uh, and if he comes uh, before the House and says something, he is accountable for it, uh, and it's reasonable for us to continue to say what we need to say on this subject, whether or not the minister is present at that moment or not. Uh, so I'm not going to quote what he said last week in the debate we had on the same subject, and quoting from column 20, 20, 2280, uh, in uh, Hansard for the 20th of February. We have been speaking about the economic cost uh, of Brexit, a matter that naturally has come up this afternoon, on which I want to say something else as well. And I quote from the noble Lord, Lord Bates, what was not given was any potential upside in leaving the European Union. He was talking about economic upside and the ability to have our own trade deals and set our own economic and trade policy. That needs to be factored in, and we remain confident that we have a bright future outside the European Union. Now, my Lords, the Government have now, at last, released their own impact assessment of Brexit, and it is frightening and it is appalling, and as a noble Lord must know, in the case of his part of the world, the North East, it predicts that GDP will be 10.5% lower than otherwise would be as a result of Brexit, and the average throughout the country is between 6.3 and uh, 9%. Uh, and that is a pretty horrific fact. And if you say, well, we've come, got, you haven't taken into account the positive, you haven't taken into account the good things, which are the positive economic return, I have to say, what is the positive economic return? No one has mentioned it. We've had these debates now for months and years. I still have yet to hear that. Now we're told well, we're going to have trade deals with a lot of countries around the world. Well, the day we leave the European Union, we lose, as we know, we lose 40 trade deals on that day. Now, Dr. Fox said, don't worry, I'll negotiate the 40 trade deals and have them ready for you when, by uh, March or April 2019. And what's actually happened is what? We've got five, five, I think. Uh, and they, respect, they, they represent, uh, in aggregate, uh, about 2% of uh, British uh, exports. Uh, now, even if he got all 40, he wouldn't have made a penny's contribution to offsetting the cost, economic cost of Brexit. He'd merely have meant that he would have not, 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 there would not be any further costs uh, from, uh, on, the, on the trade deal side to losing trade deals. Uh, but uh, whether he gets to the 40, I don't know. He's got, uh, what, 12.5% of the way now. Uh, so that's not particularly encouraging. But of course, the big issue is whether we could ever have a trade deal with the United States, which represents 25% of our exports. Now, my Lords, does anybody in the House think that that's a feasible possibility? That would mean that we would have to ex accept uh, from the United States um, beef that's uh, being impregnated with uh, antibiotics, a serious long-term threat to public health, that we would have to accept that our own beef producers were undercut by uh, the incredibly cruel methods of cultivation, zero grazing in the United States. Are we going to accept that? I don't think we will accept those sort of things. A coronated, chick coronated chicken, and so it goes on. The European Union had discussions with the United States. They broke down on these, on these, these features, and also on the investment guarantee, of course, which might also be a problem. Or well, does anybody in this House believe that the United States would sign a free trade agreement with us, leaving aside, leaving aside uh, agricultural products. <coughs> well, no one knows the United States could possibly believe that for a moment. The enormous uh, influence of the farm states in the Senate uh, is one of the first things that hits you about the Congress. It's been the case for a long time. So that's out of the question. We're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's fairyland, dreamland, dreamland. So what about China? Now we're moving down the scale a lot because we're now talking about people with much lesser proportion of our kind of much lesser proportion of our exports, but that proportion could increase rapidly over time. What about, uh, what about China? Well, my lords, does, who, 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 know, who knows China uh, is not aware of the Chinese sensitivity to unequal treaties? Who could imagine going to Mr. Xi Jinping and suggesting an unequal treaty under which uh, we have free trade with China, except that we, on our side, uh, place quotas on the import of Chinese steel? Or do you suppose that any British government could abolish those quotas and see the end of the uh, steel industry in South Wales 
and elsewhere. And indeed, the government, of course, is committed to not abolishing those steel steel quotas. So what realistic possibility is there of having a free trade deal with China? There isn't one. What about India? Well, we know from Mr. Uh, Lord, the noble Lord, Lord de la Boria here, we've we discussed these matters before, that, um, that, that uh, Mr. Modi, indeed, had, India generally has had a tradition of not signing any free trade agreements with developed countries. Most unlikely to be changed. Mr. Modi himself says that one thing I really want, which is more visas. Well, since we know that the major, or certainly one of the major, probably the major factor uh, in the result of the referendum was, uh, uh, was immigration, how are we going to turn around and say, well, now as a result of the, immigra- of the, of the um, uh, referendum, we're going to give many more visas to uh, India on special, special terms, that sort of thing. That's what Mr. Modi wants. Not likely to happen. So this is rubbish. This is the, my, this is the point, my lords. This is total rubbish. You're buying hot air here. There's nothing in it at all. There are no countervailing economic benefits, economic gains, economic revenues from Brexit. None at all. Not one. Not one's been mentioned in the course of the months of our discussions here, and not one actually really exists. None of them exist outside the fantasies of the government. It's a very serious matter because the government, I don't know whether the government had deceived themselves or not, but the government must not be allowed to deceive the British people. And above all, the British government must not be allowed to deceive the British people and lead them as a result into a situation in which, say, you know, 10% uh, of their wealth will be destroyed. 